Hello, this is uh, Dr. Shell Watts from MBAAdmit.com, and I'm here today um, with Beat the GMAT as part of the Write Like an Expert series. Um, I'm happy to be taking part today to help you understand um, good tips for approaching the Stanford Graduate School of Business 2014 MBA admission essay. So let's get started here. Um, you'll see today a list of our table of contents. Just one second, there we go. And this is the structure of today's talk. So we're going to quickly go over some company information, then go into the context for the Stanford application. Uh, one of the first things that we want to go over are admission statistics to get that context, and then understanding the uniqueness factor that you need to be successful at Stanford in admissions to the business school. And we'll also review some success stories. We'll talk very briefly about the application form and resume and how those bear on what you will include in the essays. And then, of course, we'll spend a big chunk on the Stanford essays and on the additional information section. And finally, we will let you know how to get in contact with us. So mbaadmit.com, just to introduce um, us to you, we have been, uh, we've had 24 years of advising uh, experience. We really enjoy focusing on the MBA admissions um, marketplace. We have had success with all the top 20 MBA programs. And unique about our company is we have a team of advisors from, that includes folks from Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Columbia, Georgetown, Yale, and, and the UC system. I'm always happy, happy to lend my expertise to each of our clients. Um, I have experience with Harvard admissions as well as uh, business experience with McKinsey and Morgan Stanley. And that allows us to give you a whole lot of support in your admissions process. And of course, we have expert writers who are Harvard and Oxford trained to guide you in the process. This is our website. We invite you to come by and visit our website and take a look at some of the free information as well as get in touch with us about services. And you know, we offer very low pricing, but we pride ourselves on bringing excellence with that low pricing. So we have very comprehensive services, everything from the strategy sessions to the MBA essay development and editing. You can see the full range here with more information on our, our website. And our successes, as we said, it's been all of the top MBA programs, and we greatly enjoy working with candidates. We, we know all the specifics and nuances of each of these schools and would be happy to help you. One thing that we really invite you to do is to sign up for our newsletter, which is a free news, newsletter that goes out periodically and will give you information and tips with regard to admissions. Um, oh, and by the way, you can sign up for that on the far right-hand side of our homepage. So let's go into the admissions um, context for Stanford. Now Stanford, in my opinion, is the hardest school to get into in terms of graduate admissions full time. And why is that? Let's take a look at some of these statistics. 7.1 acceptance percent acceptance rate. That is extremely low. Um, a better way to look at it is 93% of all candidates applying are rejected. And so that's a rather staggering figure. You can compare that to Harvard, which has an 11.5% acceptance rate, and Wharton, that has a 20% acceptance rate. The overall student body at Stanford is 803, compared with 1824 at Harvard and 1685 at Wharton. Another daunting statistic, two-thirds of all new students are the only persons attending from their organizations. The GMAT average is 729, which is actually only slightly higher than Harvard and Wharton. And the average GPA is 2.69, which is only slightly higher than Harvard and Wharton as well. And so what these statistics tell you is that something beyond the GMAT and the GPA drive admissions, and that something is the uniqueness of the candidate, fit with Stanford, and several other factors that we'll go over in a minute. So what are the distinguishing attributes that help define a successful Stanford applicant? Again, are you unique? Do you stand out? And that means 
several things. Do you have a very strong personal backstory? Um, do you have notable professional achievements beyond what even a very high performing professional would have? Do you have really notable extracurricular achievements? Um, there are only so many schools where extracurriculars actually weigh extremely heavily enough to determine uh, to make a difference between the final admissions or not admissions decision, and Stanford is one of those schools. Another thing that distinguishes a successful Stanford applicant is uh, do you have the potential for a high impact career and other post-MBA contributions? Do you fit with Stanford? That's very important given how, how small the class is. And do you have an ability to contribute to Stanford? Um, that is very important, again, because with only 400 plus students in each class, uh, the, every seat allocated is extremely important. And they, Stanford wants to know that that student that gets the seat can make a tremendous contribution. So another way of saying this is even a stellar applicant, someone who has outstanding um, GPA 3.9, a 760 GMAT score, work experiences with a company that's considered one of the industry best, even that candidate may not get into Stanford if they fail to present an application that shows that uniqueness, that fit with Stanford, the ability to have an impact. So today's talk is going to center somewhat on how do you establish that, how's the best way to approach the essays, and then, of course, how do you work with the rest of the application to give to Stanford what it's looking for in terms of uniqueness and these other facets. One way to start thinking about this is to look at what Stanford is emphasizing through its curriculum. If you go to the website, if you go through um, the actual curriculum itself and the special programs that they have uh, put in place, you see these sorts of things, references to helping to cultivate professionals who will invent the future, who will reshape or shape an industry, who will capture opportunities. Um, they talk about innovation, entrepreneurialism, thought leadership. You should be seeking to convey that about yourself uh, to the degree that you, you truly have that in your background. And that would go quite a long way to demonstrating the fit with Stanford. Another way of saying that, an ideal candidate, is someone who shows that they not only have the, the threshold amount of what Stanford is looking for, which is excellence professionally, academically, and in extracurricular activities, but beyond that, that they have a passion and talent to make a truly distinct and enduring positive impact through work. And by work, I mean not necessarily professional, but professional and um, philanthropic work, work in the community. I want to walk you through some success stories um, simply because it's, um, it gives you context for understanding the difference between an outstanding candidate in terms of academics and pro professional achievement and the truly unique candidate who is very attractive to Stanford. So I've got three examples for you here. Candidate A. This candidate is an example of one of the most dramatic sort of turnarounds in terms of the admissions process with Stanford. He was uh, a candidate who was from Europe and had actually applied to, to Stanford two years in a row, um, along with the other top schools, Harvard, Wharton, Columbia, and MIT. He had been rejected two years in a row when applying on his own, um, and many times with many of those schools um, without an interview whatsoever. So he came to MBAadmit.com, and I reviewed his credentials, and in my opinion, he was clearly a top choice candidate, but what had gone wrong is he just failed to present his candidacy effectively in the application. So the outcomes after we highlighted his strengths and um, told his story in a very compelling way is that he was admitted to all five of those schools, Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Columbia, and MIT. And so part of what we would like to discuss today is, you know, what do we do to be that attractive to Stanford? Let's see. There we go. 
candidate A, so let me give you some of his background. Age, 28 year, years old, from a European country. He was actually a doctor who left medicine, and um, he did so because he had traveled to a developing country, and after serving as a doctor for a while, found himself in the midst of a notable health care crisis um, and chose to use business as a way to address it. His GPA was very high both in college and in medical school. His GMAT score is 680, so notably below the average for Stanford. And so his story is a story of the fact that you don't have to hit all of their averages in order to be successful. His full-time work experience three years after transitioning from medicine to business. And he had most definitely had the uniqueness factor, his personal story. He had wonderful stories in terms of growing up with a single mother and overcoming economic obstacles, about um, developing strong personal values in the midst of trials, and then also of developing this passion to make a positive difference. And then that eventually shows up in taking the risk to make the transition to business and through his entrepreneurial work. Assessment of his profile and outcomes. He was extremely unique for the factors I just mentioned. He clearly had a record of true leadership as an initiator, as an innovator. Um, because he was in a developing country and originally from Europe, he had proven that he could work amid diversity, which was a, a big plus for him. Um, what had gone wrong before was simply that his application had failed to um, present the right information, failed to use business relevant terms, and on the whole were very poorly written. His recommendations were weak, and his long-term revision was not well-defined. After recrafting the application and focusing on the strengths, um, again, he had a completely different response. Um, Stanford, um, in what should have been the interview, actually called him up and said, you're admitted, and we wanted to talk to you about why you should choose Stanford over Harvard. Candidate B, another example. This candidate had been rejected from Harvard and Wharton the year prior when applying on his own, and he decided he wanted to try again, and he applied at Stanford and at Wharton with mbaadmit.com. And he, again, was someone who, to me, had that blend that made him a very strong candidate for Stanford. 26-year-old, he came from a developing country, a very promising developing country, um, came from investment banking at one of the most respected banks in this country. His academics were not the top, but they were very strong at one of the best universities in his country. He had a 700 GMAT score and four and a half years of work experience with promotions. Um, interestingly enough, his extracurriculars were rather weak when he came to our, our company. However, we were able to build up in really important ways that were high impact before he applied. Our overall assessment of his candidacy was that he was a clearly a true leader and that you get that sense from, for him because of this strong personal story he had in terms of uh, overcoming extreme poverty, getting admission to a top college in his country, doing well there and, and going from there to a very established large company and excelling. Um, he had actually gotten work experience beyond what is typical for his tenure. And by the time you know, we had finished helping him augment his extracurriculars, his extracurriculars looked very strong going into Stanford. We made sure that he presented a very strong long-term long vision, which again spoke to the, the fact that he was clearly on route to be a very strong future leader, not only in his industry, but also in his country. And we highlighted that tremendous leadership potential in his post-MBA career. Again, the outcome was that he was admitted to Stanford. And then the last example I'll give, candidate C, a 24-year-old male um, from Latin America. He had really strong academics, a top 10% of his class, an A average, and a GMAT of 740. Um, this is a candidate who, when he first came to me, I did not see the uniqueness factor, but after we did a very deep strategy session, I emerged from that thinking he would be a pretty clear shot at Stanford. Um, so what gave me that impression? 
the fact is that he was strong in all the threshold categories that I, I focus on um, when I'm looking at Stanford's so a professional, academic, and extracurricular. Um, and he was also very unique. What made him unique is that he had gone to uh, one of the top companies in his country. He had excelled there, but he had a passion for work in a very niche area. He took a risk after having proven himself in the big company context and launched his own company. And while the revenues were not yet impressive, it was being acknowledged in the community for impact. So we were, we were able to focus on the impact in the community. We were able to focus on um, the entrepreneurial spirit that he had, the passion that he had for using his company not only to impact in the industry, but also to impact to philanthropy. We presented a very strong long-term vision. He, we helped make sure that his recommendation writers knew how to convey information about him that would be well received at Stanford. And we again, the overall picture was one of a, someone who was already making an impact, passionate, very talented, and very intent on making a difference in the future. He was accepted to Stanford. So let's go with those examples in mind and start to talk about how you as a candidate would approach Stanford. I want to touch on the actual application form and resume simply because you need to bear in mind what you're putting in these sections as you consider what you should be putting in the essays. Stanford offers an extremely thorough application, and that is a really important main point. Um, when you look at it, if you get into the online application sections, you'll see that the resume, um, Stanford suggests a one-page resume, but it doesn't restrict you to one, one page. So should you choose to go to two pages, that is an option. Um, and for many candidates, that might be a good option if they have really strong extracurricular activities and they want to showcase those a little bit more. It means that you can put information in the resume and not feel you have to try to touch on everything in the essays. Also on the application, you have, with each job description, a lot of um, space to, de to devote to describing your responsibilities, your most significant challenge, your most significant accomplishment. And again, 320 characters to each of those three aspects means that you're able to really showcase any advanced responsibilities you've had, impact that you've had. So again, you don't need to try to touch on everything in the essays. The college extracurricular activities and the the post-college activities in the community, you have two separate areas where you can list four different types of work with organizations or activities. So again, that is quite a lot of space relative to what other schools offer. And you're able to give the content in the application form itself. And then, of course, it also covers honors and awards. So bear all of that in mind and use it strategically. Stanford says itself that it, as it's looking at your application, it's trying to see, um, have you been cultivating your leadership? Have you been making a difference? The application form itself allows you to start to establish that the answer to those aspects are yes. So prepare that online application very well and consider what you've put there before you actually write the essays in depth. Now moving on to the essays. The main task, given what we saw before in terms of the statistics and how difficult it is to get into Stanford with a 7% admission rate, um, your task is to move beyond the threshold of the basic threshold of what Stanford expects in successful candidates, which is excellence professionally, academically, and in the extracurricular camp. Move beyond that to shine a light on those experiences that make you unique. Distinguish yourself, and, and to do that, there's multiple ways, different things that you can do to distinguish yourself as a unique candidate who can have an impact both at Stanford and beyond. You would make a, uh, present a compelling blend of past achievements. You can draw attention to winning attributes, your innovation, your leadership, your creativity, your willingness to take risks. You can discuss your passions and where they came from present a very strong vision of your future, demonstrate your commitment to making a positive impact 
you can refer to how you've done that in the past and how you intend to do it in the future, show a very strong fit with Stanford, which we will discuss in greater depth in a few minutes. And then also, in the process of writing these essays, make sure to acknowledge not just what you will gain from Stanford, but what you can give to Stanford. In what ways will you be a great student and help them envision that? So essay number one, what matters most to you and why? This question causes many candidates um, a lot of anxiety. It's so open-ended, they, they feel they don't know how to begin to approach it. I would say that what you should be doing is, first of all, looking at what Stanford advises. We have the, um, the actual website link at the top gives you guidance in approaching essay one and essay two. So read that over first and understand what it is that they're advising. They want to have a vi vivid image of who you are. They want to understand the values, experiences, and lessons that have shaped your perspective. And they want to hear about events, people, situations that have influenced your life. That should be a part of essay number one. So consider themes like what are you passionate about? What is your philosophy of life and what drives you? And where do, they, where do those things come from? The where do they come from helps us to start to delve into experiences, events, and people that have shaped the person you are. What achievements have been the fruit of your passion? We should hear not only about what's important to you in terms of what drives you, but also why that's important, how has it shown up in the past, and then how how will it show up in the future? Why is it important in terms of what you will achieve in the future? So you're painting a picture about yourself. You're telling your story. Bear in mind what Stanford itself says. We have the link at the bottom. That we believe the past actions usually are the best predictor of future performance. That is a very powerful statement that they want to sort of see what you've done in the past and then the implications for what you say you'll do in the future. Stanford also says, we believe that how you have developed your talents is as important as what you've actually accomplished. So the why becomes a very interesting and important question. It's not just what you've done, but why and where is it going. They want to understand you, the person. One way that might help you as you're approaching SA1 is to think back to the candidates we profiled, candidate A, B, and C. Um, and think about how that would have manifested in their applications. We had candidate A, the doctor working through business on addressing a pressing healthcare crisis um, in a developing country. We had candidate B, the banker who had overcome extreme poverty to achieve professional success and is now committed to impacting not only his industry but his broader community in the future. And then candidate C, the entrepreneur who was already making an impact through his company in the community and is determined to expand not only his corporation and his impact in the industry, but also the, the community work that's a part of that company. It would be easier for each of these, given their stories, to write as they want, tell us about their passion, tell us where it came from, tell us the experiences that brought that passion about, and then tell us not only what they've achieved, um, as a result of that, but also what they intend to achieve in the future. Essay two, what do you really want to do and why Stanford? Again, go to the website at Stanford and take a good look at what they advise. And this is from the Stanford website. Um, they're asking you to explain your view of the future. They actually don't want you to recount the past, which is why for the resume it's important that you are able to give some depth to your past professional achievements. In this essay, you should be forward-looking. You know, what are your goals in the future? And then they, again, they are specific and they say your future career aspirations and your rationale for earning your MBA at Stanford. What do you really want to do? So answering the first part of that question, you have latitude to write about short-term, medium-term, or long-term career goals. Um, make sure to give definition to your goals. That's a very important part of the process, particularly for Stanford. And, and I'll talk about that more in, in just a second. Um, 
And then use this, well, the goals essay to distinguish yourself. And so you do that to things such as your specific interests, your passion, and the impact you intend to make. When I say give definition to your goals, an example that doesn't work as well, particularly for a school like Stanford, is a very broad, vague view of your future, such as I want to be an effective leader or I want to start my own company. You can imagine that those are very broad. It doesn't allow the community to envision you as a future leader. There's nothing there to really paint a picture. And for those candidates who are coming from very overrepresented uh, backgrounds, so say the IT for a national engineer, um, that person, if they say, I would like to start an, an IT company, will make themselves one of thousands and thousands of other candidates saying the same thing. So you, what you want to do instead is to use the long-term goal to distinguish yourself. And so to the degree you have more clarity about your long-term or medium-term or short-term goals, you should present that. So better examples, things that give definition, would be I've always been captivated by electronics. In the long term, I seek to and then explain a little bit. Or even more specifically, I intend to start an electronics company that improves greatly the quality of life among mass consumers by producing high quality, low cost goods for the Latin American market. That's very specific. Not all candidates will know in that level of depth what they want to do, but if you do, then you can consider that sort of definition. It helps to distinguish yourself. And then the second part of this essay number two is, you know, why Stanford? This is a very important aspect to answer. So even though you don't have very much space in the essay itself, you should really focus on giving them a detailed understanding of why you think Stanford is, is best for you. Stanford wants to know that you need their curriculum and resources to achieve your goals. There are so few seats that that's a very important thing for them to, to get an understanding of that you in particular need their resources. And then Stanford wants to know that you can make a distinct and valued contribution to your peers and to Stanford graduate school business. So you should be seeking to convey those aspects in the essay response. How will Stanford enable you to achieve your goals? You have um, an ability to establish that or explain that um, through details. You want to move beyond the issue of why you want an MBA to why you want a Stanford MBA. And the details that can matter there would be curriculum, faculty, teaching methods, special programs, the Silicon Valley setting, um, the nature of the student body, the culture and the clubs, as well as the alumni network and recruiting options. So details help you to establish Stanford is the right place for me, given what I need. And then what can you give to Stanford? And so make sure you touch on that in terms of what is it about your background, professional achievements, academic successes, academic training, that will allow you to make an impact at Stanford. Um, what experiences do you have in the extracurricular arena? And what sort of personal attributes will make you someone that inspires your peers? So make sure to touch on that in this essay as well. That is all a lot of information. It means that you need to stay very on point as you're writing. But this essay in particular can help to establish what is very important to Stanford, that there's a really good fit between you and the school. And then essay three, it's essentially a leadership question. Um, they give you three options and very specifically ask that you write about not just what you did, but what was the outcome and how do people respond? You're restricted to um, experiences in the last three years. And the, the options are option A focuses on when you built and developed a team whose performance exceeded their expectation. Option B focuses on a time you identified and pursued an opportunity to improve an organization. And option C talks about 
a time when you went beyond what was defined or established. The biggest concern most candidates have about essay three is not really choosing between the three options because in some ways they overlap. And so um, you can take an example and you know keep looking at what your response, what the details would be and which of those it fits most specifically. But the bigger concern is what type of example do I present? Do I present a professional example or do I present a personal example? Um, younger candidates tend to be much more nervous about trying to do a professional example because they think I haven't led a team, so how can I talk about um, one of these topics? How can I talk about improving an organization if I am three years into a company and I haven't uh, led a team yet? Um, and then the older candidate, they seem to have more of a broader sense that they can choose professionally or extracurricularly, but they don't know which to do. The complication is that whether you should do personal or professional is really a candidate-specific um, issue. In the context of your own candidacy, you need to, to think about what does your application most need. If you're someone who needs a professional experience to overcome maybe a slightly lower GMAT or a slightly lower GPA, then even if you're younger, it may be to your benefit to focus on a professional example. And likewise, someone who's very accomplished professionally and is able to convey that on the resume and in the application form itself, if they have something really notable in the extracurricular camp, they have latitude to choose that without that taking away what would have been great strategic content for a professional example. So each candidate will need to look at their their candidacy and the needs of the candidacy to know which to choose, whether it's professional or personal, and then look at the range of, of different topics you have and look at the layers of things that you can talk about in answering the question about impact and opportunities and going beyond what is defined. The additional information section. This section is one where they very carefully detail what sorts of things should be in this section. The most common, um, and this is directly from the Stanford instructions on the essay part of the website. So taking a look at this, again, very specific about what should be in this section. And the most common question is, well, can I use it to write another essay that has exclusively positive information, one that takes, for example, one that takes the reader more deeply into my personal backstory. My opinion on that is because they were very specific about what sorts of things should be here, and most of it is extenuating circumstances, that you actually should not take the opportunity to use it for just another essay that takes them more in-depth about your candidacy. Um, you can make, you can present plenty of positive information in this area, but I believe it should be restricted to the sorts of information that they were requesting specifically in the instructions here. Um, there are other schools for whom I think you can use the optional for an essay of your choice, um, but this one is pretty specific and does not seem to be encouraging an, an additional essay that is not focused on this information. So for those of you who do have something to talk about in terms of a weakness that has to be addressed uh, per the instructions of the additional information section, what are some best practices? I would say remember these things. If there is a weakness, don't give a prolonged discussion of, the, of that weakness. Um, it just highlights it more. So you should be, you should acknowledge the weakness and be short and sweet, acknowledge it. Um, and then if possible, redirect the attention to positive things that might offset that weakness. And then most importantly, don't make excuses. There's a difference between explaining a weakness and then trying to excuse it um, through factors that may not excuse it. Um, and so keep that difference in mind. 
And also bear in mind that, um, let's go back to this page, that when you are discussing something, so say in college you had some crisis that happened and you had one year of very poor grades, um, again, acknowledge it, explain what happened, point to positives that offset it, but don't dwell on it because you don't want to overemphasize something that may not have been a major factor for the school, for Stanford, as it was looking at your candidacy. Okay, so the last part here is how can you contact us? We're more than happy to um, work with folks who are interested in Stanford. So this is our contact information. I know that we're now about to move into the Q&A, and so I'm more than happy to um, discuss questions that you have about the Stanford application. Um, I do also want to remind those of you listening that uh, there will be a chat after this on the Stanford wall, so make sure to visit that chat and get more of your questions answered after this webinar series. So that will conclude um, this presentation. I'm happy to take Q&A. Thanks, Shelley. Um, as usual, great job for everyone. This is um, Beatrice Kim from Beat the GMAT, and you've been listening to Dr. Shell Watts from MBA Admit um, break down this year's Stanford GSB essays for our Beat the GMAT Write Like an Expert series. As Dr. Watts mentioned, um, if we don't get a chance to answer your questions in today's webinar, please do go to the comment wall on our MBA Watch page and we have people there standing by, as well, as well as Dr. Watts. I think you'll get a chance to swing by at some point to be able to answer your questions there. Um, so Dr. Watts, first question for you. Um, how important is age when applying? Um, specifically, your European candidates usually apply later, like 28 to 30. Do 30 years old and plus have a lower possibility of getting accepted into Stanford? Stanford, um, there are certain schools that are known for skewing lower, as I call it, in, with age, and Stanford is one of those. So I would say Stanford, Harvard, and Morton are schools that tend to generally favor slightly younger candidates over o older candidates. Um, I don't think 28 is old. I don't think 29 is old from their perspective either. I think that once you hit the 30-year-old range, um, that is where age may start to kick in as a factor, but every candidate is different. Some candidates um, were in non-traditional careers and then came to a different career, which is why they're older. Some candidates got master's degrees, um, and that's why they're older. Um, so it depends on the candidate and what was the reason for the fact that they're 28, I'm sorry, that they're 30 or older at the time of applying. If someone, for instance, had been in private equity and stayed in private equity since they were 22, and they're now 31, the school may think, well, that person really has worked their way out of needing an MBA. And so you're going to have the job of trying to explain to them why you actually need it, what experience you're lacking, or knowledge right. that you're lacking that you actually need. Um, so it can affect outcomes at Stanford um, over the age of 30. But there's no hard and fast rule. It is, a, it is really a function of the overall candidacy. Great. Thanks, Dr. Watts. And I know that's a question that comes up quite a bit in our community, so appreciate answering that question. We have another question here asking about um, how long does it take on average to complete a Stanford application? And specifically, how long does it take to uh, complete the Stanford application through MBA Admit? Well, we've had we've had candidates come to us literally like three days before a deadline, just oh. the process. And one of my biggest long shot success stories, he had a 2.8 GPA, um, did that. He was like three days before the round two deadline, and he wanted to apply. And so, I actually thought, in spite of the 2.8, that he had he had a good shot at getting in. And so I was, you know, are you sure you want to try to do this in three days? We did it in three days, and he actually did get in. Uh, so that's possible, but you know, if you want to manage your stress levels well, I would say um, 
a comfortable amount of time is three weeks because that gives you the time to mobilize your recommendation writers to do a strategy session where you go in depth and think about you know the story that you want to present. Um, so three weeks is comfortable, two weeks is brisk, and three days is doable. It just depends on you know, the circumstances. Well, I would imagine, gosh, three days. Well, I would imagine that people who come, you know, in a shorter amount of period, two weeks or so, they still need to have a better, a pretty good sense of, of their story and, and the types of credentials that they want to make sure is, is kind of available through their um, application, correct? Well, you know, what we do at MBA Admin, we've been doing this for so long, is that once, you know, we send out a questionnaire, it's nine pages long. Um, once we get that back, it's very clear to us what things should be emphasized. So we can definitely direct the client very well and give them really good structure and guidance. So I would, you know, a lot of times when the candidate is trying to do that by themselves, they go to the wrong topics. And so normally if someone has already written their essays and they come to us, it's the wrong topics for the most part. So, so I just think, you know, if you get with the very knowledgeable consultant and, you know, just references are important for that, just trying to figure out who you think is good, um, that they can help a great deal and shorten the time you actually need to figure this out. Great. Um, so we've got quite a bit more questions here. Let's see if we can tackle some of these. How helpful is it to get a recommendation from a Stanford alum? Well, I don't think that that should take priority. It's like a nice extra thing if that happens to be the case. But what's most important is that it's a combination of the person being superior to you um, and then willing to write a truly extraordinary endorsement of your application and of you as a candidate. So those two things are more important than being a Stanford alumni. If um, the person happens to be an alumni member also, then that's just an added plus. Um, but truly, Stanford wants to hear from someone who is objective, in which that normally means someone superior to you, um, that you are a star, that you are outstanding, that you're you know, head and shoulders above your peers, and that you have a very promising future. And so getting that sort of strong endorsement um, is more important than getting a letter that may not be as enthusiastic, but that person is a member of the Stanford community. Yeah, and we hear it so many times here on Beat the GMAT where people ask, you know, where our members say, how important is it to get a recommendation from the CEO of my company or how important is it to get it from someone who's associated with that business program? And exactly as you answered, you know, make sure your recommend, recommender knows you and knows you really well and can speak to your um, credentials. So I, I really appreciate that answer. Yeah. Um, so a couple of more, and I, I know we're already at time, but if you don't mind, Shelley, um, if we could just stay a little bit longer since we got a, a bit of a late start, would that work for you? Start, yeah, we started later, so I'm more than happy to take more questions. Fantastic. So we have a question, um, a couple of questions around the same theme. Um, you said we should talk about our past experiences and how they shaped us on the first essay, but we should also talk about on the second essay as well. Is it okay if we repeat some of the information or should we keep both essays very different in content? Well, you don't want too much repetition because, I mean, you don't, the schools keep reducing the amount of essay content you have. And so normally you need to write essays you need to actually write the whole set in Stanford's case, one, two, and three, together because you need to make sure that there's not too much overlap and, and um, because otherwise you're taking space that could have been used to introduce more new information um, and, and you're depriving yourself of that space. So um, I would say write all three of the essays and then where there is repetition, see is there a way to get it more in one essay and less than the other so that you save that space for other information. Okay, great. Probably have time for maybe two, two more questions. So one is, to what extent does the brand of your institution, and I'm assuming this person is referencing their undergraduate institution, uh, matter for admissions into Stanford GSB? Well, I'll answer both in terms of college and in terms of company because they're two different answers. Um, in terms of college, 
it's really important how you did where you went, not where you went. So, you know, for instance, in India, a common question is, well, I didn't go to IIT, so can I get into Stanford? It's, IIT goes a long, long way to helping you access the top schools, but if you did extremely well at another school, which is, you know, just not IIT, but you're the top of the school, um, then you're going to still have a really good chance of accessing schools, and that applies also to United States schools. So wonderful if you went to Yale um, and did well, but if you went to a state school and had a 3.9 and had a magna cum laude or a summa cum laude, you should still, in the academic realm, be seen as someone who has achieved excellence. So in that way, the college doesn't matter so much um, as long as you did well where you went. In terms of the, if, if that question was applying to, to a company, so does the prestige of the company matter in terms of admissions? I would definitely say, yes, it does, and more importantly for people who are abroad, so for nationals, because um, all the top schools seem to favor candidates coming out of the multinational companies when they are foreign nationals. And so it does, it does not mean that you cannot get into these schools if you are at a small company that they don't know, never have heard of before. But it does mean that you have challenges that you have to address in the essay content um, to make sure that the school understands the value of your work experience. Great. Thank you, Dr. Watts. So we, we have one last question before we end today's session. And this question is one that probably rings true for quite a bit of our members. And this one is, can you give any specific advice for reapplicants? Well, the biggest thing for a reapplicant is to really look and understand what didn't go well. So we had in the Stanford um, today's examples, Kenneth A, B, and C, two of those were reapplicants, and so you had they had to take a good look at why did I not succeed? What was the weakness in the application? And the schools, most of them, you know, will look at you with totally fresh eyes if you fix the problem. So the first step is to figure out what the problem was. For some people, the GMAT was just too low, so they had to retake it, and that was the only major flaw, and so they may gain admission the next year. For other candidates, the entire application was weak, and so they need to actually do an overhaul of the essays and, and help their recommendation writers be more effective in what they're conveying. Um, in others, it may have been a lack of work experience, um, and so putting another year or two of work experience before the next application could be useful. So, you know, identify the problem, fix the problem, and then um, hopefully you would have a different outcome. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Watts. Um, as always, it's just been a pleasure. And uh, as, as mentioned, this is uh, you've been listening to Dr. Watts from MBA Admit. If you have um, any more questions, feel free to go to our Stanford comment wall. Also, if you enjoy Dr. Shell's information that she just presented here today, please sign up for her newsletter to get all these types of great information um, on mbaadmit.com. It's a great website, great resource for you for those who are applying to Stanford GSB. And then also uh, check out Dr. Shelley's um, blog, mbaadmit.com slash category slash mbaadmit blog topics. So thank you, everyone, uh, for a great session. This, again, is Write Like an Expert for Stanford GSB, GSB essays. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs>